recording over here. So last time we ended here. The total energy. Can you see that? Yeah. total energy of a cavity filled with electromagnetic waves. And remember that these waves, they are transverse. They will look kind of like that. Or kind of like this. And they are, so they look like this if they are in the, in the uh, X direction. So they are transverse to the, to the displacement of the wave. Um, so in the Y direction, you know, they will look kind of like this. So it, then you will have a transverse wave that will be along the um, the x direction. So they are always orthogonal to the direction of the displacement of the wave. And you have all possible uh, number of nodes, for example. So all possible frequencies from a minimum one that is just like that to infinity. You can have as many as you want over here. There's no, there's no limit upwards. And the whole box is filled with, with that um, a transverse electromagnetic field, transverse electromagnetic wave field. So because we have two, um, Two well, two transverse modes, we put the two in there. And then we're going to sum over all the states of the system. And we're gonna put the expected value, the expectation value of the energy of that state. And these Because you can also write it as S H bar omega S or DS over here, right? So we have uh, all the possible states. This was the Planck distribution times the expectation value of the energy. And then you add over all possible energies, you get the total energy inside that cavity. So U is two sum over all the states, H bar omega N divided by the exponent of H bar omega N over tau minus one. And I have this omega n because the frequency, the angular frequency depends on, on n, essentially the number of nodes that you have. So this frequency is quantized. And this is equation four point sixteen. So now let's gonna look at that in more detail. 
Uh, this equation is over all the states in X, in Y, and in Z. So actually, a better way to write it is two. And I guess uh, Kittel adds the two later. So I think equation 416 is without the two, but it's just uh, the modes. So this is going to be the sum over nx, the sum over ny, and the sum over nz, h bar omega, n divided by the exponent of h bar omega n over tau minus one. So this omega n is equal to c pi over l. C is the speed of light. Uh, pi over l was uh, some factor that we get from the arguments of the signs um, that are the solutions of the wave equation. And then we have uh, nx squared plus ny squared plus n z squared square root of that okay so if you look at what omega n is it's actually a three-dimensional vector Uh, we have n x over here, n y over here, and n z over here. It is going to have only discrete values. So you might have It's gonna look like that, right? So it can be this vector, 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 but the values that it can acquire are discrete. Have you seen um, a construction like this, a mathematical construction like this in other classes? Or no? Okay, so I was reading my modern physics book uh, from when I was an undergrad and this construction is over there, but I don't know if you guys saw it in modern physics. And almost for sure you see it in like quantum two, but I know that most of you have not taken quantum two. So, but I'm, I'm just wondering if you're familiar with this kind of construction. It's okay if you're not. So nobody has seen it? Okay, sounds, sounds good. So it's actually kind of, um, you see it often in like different situations in physics. So let's, let's take a look. So um, I personally get a little confused with the omega n. So I'm gonna use kn. So kn is uh, omega n divided by c here. Yeah. So kn is called, as I mentioned last time, is the wave number, um, but Later in life, uh, you will see that the Fourier transform of having like all these energies, it's a, it's a discrete field like this one. 
So each one of these is called a K point. And so I'm, I'm going to make all the required substitutions so that it looks like um, like derivations in Kittel, but I have trouble thinking about omega n, so I'm going to use I'm going to use kn. So uh, kn is going to be uh, well, we can put the c over here, and then that's kn. It's almost the same. Okay, so. You know, this field is uh, three dimensional. I draw the only one plane to make things a little easier to visualize with my awful drawing. Uh, but this is a three dimensional field and it starts at zero, okay? So uh, it is only one octant, like if you divide space, uh, Euclidean space and in quadrants, you know, for a plane and then you uh, add the additional axis, you get eight octants. And this is called the first octant. So uh, all of them are positive and X and Y and in Z. So it's one eight of uh, an infinite space. So as L, in the case of L becomes um, very large, so L goes to infinity, then, you know, let's call this distance just D, the separation between the K points uh, D over L goes to zero. All right, so if you consider a um, very large box, and that is a very reasonable assumption, usually the box is going to be much bigger than your, your wavelength, the, the, the wave in there. Uh, then this becomes relatively, these distances less and less important. And so you can consider that they're not discrete anymore, that you have a continuum, a continuum of points. So then we can replace these sums over here by integrals. And so let's see. L over pi kn is kx in the i direction plus ky in the j direction plus kz in the k direction. And same for dk or the kn. Uh, it's going to be dkx and so on. Okay, so we can rewrite that as two integral from zero to infinity of L over pi. dkx integral from zero to infinity L over pi dky integral from zero to infinity L over pi dkz. And then this part uh, for the time being, I'm just gonna write it as the expectation value of the energy. We don't need to worry about it yet. Okay, so then U is two L over pi cubed 
Um, one half, I'm gonna put it, I'm gonna put it inside. One half decay x, and I'm putting the one half in there because I, now I'm going to make this integral go from negative infinity to infinity. So this is uh, an even function, so we can do that. Minus infinity to infinity, one half uh, dKy integral from minus infinity to infinity, one half dKz. So then u is two L over pi cubed one over two cubed um, integral from minus infinity to infinity of dk x integral of minus infinity to infinity of dk y and integral of minus infinity to infinity of dk z. And now, this thing over here is just the integral over all freaking space. Okay, so it's a big, big space. But as I mentioned, now we have these uh, one half to, uh, sorry, this is cubed. One half cubed, so you get one eighth. So it is one eighth of the infinite space. So we can rewrite this. So this is in Cartesian coordinates, but we can write it in spherical coordinates also. Since it's just, oh, and then I guess we'll have the energy. So u two l over pi cube one over two cube integral from zero to infinity. k squared dk integral from zero to pi sine theta d theta and integral from zero to two pi d phi. So is it clear what I'm doing here? Yes or no? Yes? But it's exactly the same, right? Okay, so this part over here is two pi, right? It's just uh, d phi from zero to two pi. This one over here is gonna be minus cosine of pi 
uh, plus cosine of zero. Uh, so this is minus one. Uh, so, and then with this minus, you get a plus one. And this one is plus one. So this is equal to two. So, so this is going to be four pi. And that makes sense because this whole thing is the area of a sphere. Right? So I'm going to move this over here to L over pi cubed. Oh, I keep writing squared, one half cubed, four pi integral from zero to infinity of k squared dk, and then that energy. So this triple integral, uh, these two give you the surface of a sphere. This is the radius of the sphere. So as you integrate uh, all the possible surfaces, right? So um, this is difficult to draw, but you have your sphere over here. This is your vector k. And um, you are integrating over this solid sphere, right? So they'll give you, in normal cases, without this energy, it will give you the volume of a sphere, right? So you integrate, this one will give you, uh, k cubed over three, and then you had the four pi, so that's the volume of a sphere. But now we have this thing over here. Uh, so that's gonna make things a little bit different. So, um, so we can, this is gonna be one eight. Um, we can get rid of these four, and this becomes a two, right? And we can get rid of these two with these two. And we have an extra, we have a pi over here and a pi cubed over here. So it's going to be L cubed over pi squared. Mm hmm integral from zero to infinity of k squared dk, and then the energy. So this one over here is equation uh, 4.17, and this one is equation 4.18. Okay, um, well, I have to make a few substitutions to make it look exactly the same. So you, um, actually, I'm going to write it up here. So that is a cool integral, right? It's like a weighted sphere. 
um, in the regular sphere, sphere, you know, all the you can think that all the mass is located. Um, it's it's uniform here uh, because you have the expectation value of the energy. Things are weighted a little bit differently, so it's a weighted sphere. So you. L cubed over pi squared integral from zero to infinity of dk k squared h bar um, c omega. Uh, sorry, that's ck. So the other thing that we need in this part is mm. I don't know if it's an equation in Kittel. I, don't, I cannot find it but it's this relationship mm, c k right this is the dispersion it's called the dispersion relation so it's the um this is the proportionality constant the speed of light is the proportionality constant between the wave number and the angular frequency so we can use that. So it will be, you know, omega is C K. So we had omega N before, so I'm just putting C K in there. And then this is exponent of h bar ck over tau minus one. So now let x be defined as h bar ck divided by tau. And if this is the case, then k, I'm going to put it over here, k is tau x divided by h bar c, and dk is tau dx divided by h bar c. So then we can rewrite this equation. It's going to be u equals l cubed over pi squared integral from zero to infinity. We have the dk, so that's tau dx over h bar c. Then we have the k squared, which is um, t squared x, uh, x squared, h bar c, whole thing squared. And then uh, this is going to be h bar c, and then k tau x divided by h bar c and then the exponent uh, is just x minus one so this will go away and we can take a lot of stuff out so we have um, l cubed over pi squared, 
we have one, two, three, four taus. So this is tau to the fourth. And we have one, two, three, h bar c. So h bar c cubed. And then inside we have integral from zero to infinity of dx. And then we have x cubed, we have three of them. And then, um, how is that typically written? And we're gonna put the x cubed over here. And then that is divided by e to the x minus one. Okay, so that's kind of cool. This is equation 4.19, this one down here. Have you seen this integral before? Are there any mathematicians in the class? That's a nasty integral. Um, so the Riemann zeta function is um, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use S. Yeah, it's better. That is the definition of the Riemann zeta function. If the real part of S is greater than one. Okay, so based on that, uh, this part over here is what we have over here. Um, so S minus one, this one is equal to three, so S is equal to four. So we can put a four over here. The uh, zeta function of four is this. Okay, so then we're pretty close. Um, this is the gamma function. So if we move the gamma function on to this side, and it's gonna be zeta function, gamma function equals that. Okay, and the good thing is that uh, some mathematician like you know, a couple hundred years ago, actually less than that probably, um, solve the zeta function, right, for four. So the zeta function, the zeta function for even numbers is actually not that ugly. For, for odd numbers, it, it gets kind of messy, but. So this one is equal to one plus 
1 over 2 to the 4th plus 1 over uh, 3 to the 4th plus dot dot dot. It's an infinite series. And that is equal to pi to the 4th divided by 90. And don't really ask me how. I just went to Wikipedia. And then the gamma function of four. What is the gamma function, by the way? What does it represent? Yeah, it's the generalization of the factorial, right, to continuous numbers. So uh, gamma of four is just three factorial, which is equal to six. Okay, so these whole thing over here, the uh, that integral is equal to uh, pi fourth to the fourth divided by 90 times six. So that's pi over four divided by 15. And that is what Kittel tells you that the, that integral is equal to, to this. Okay, so it gets worse, believe me. But this one is not too bad. It's a, it's a constant. Pi over four divided, uh, pi to the fourth power divided by 15. Awesome. So now we can get rid of uh, this pi squared. And this will become pi squared. Mm. Uh, this L cubed, we can call it the volume. And so if we divide the total energy in the cavity by the volume to get uh, the space energy density or the volume energy density, and this is uh, pi squared divided by 15 h bar cubed c cubed tau to the fourth. Have you seen this before? It should be equal. What is it? Well, yeah. So this is um, a Stefan Boltzmann equation. Stefan Boltzmann uh, radiation law. Okay, so what you probably remember, what you should remember, and this is a little bit less uh, important, the actual number over here, but the energy density of a black body is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature. And I hope that you remember that from, well, it should have been modern physics, but maybe thermal and fluid physics too, I don't know. Okay, so this is equation, uh, this is equation of 4.20. And it's a, it's a pretty, pretty big um, event in the history of thermodynamics. Um, okay. 
So let's continue over here. So we're gonna go back to equation 4.18. So 4.18 was this one. Okay, so I mentioned that K is equal to omega over C. And so DK is gonna be D omega over C. So I'm going to make the substitution. This is gonna look like uh, D omega over C. This is gonna be uh, omega squared over C squared. And this is gonna be omega over C. The same thing here, omega over C. And so we can get rid of the C's over here. And we write this as mm, Oh, there's a, I have a mistake in my notes. Let me correct that. Okay, so this one is, um, We're gonna move the L cubed over here as the volume. And that is gonna be equal to uh, H bar divided by I squared C cubed. We have uh, three C's over there. Integral from zero to infinity D omega. And then we're gonna have the omega cubed divided by the exponent of h bar omega over tau minus one. Okay, this is equation 4.21. So we just rewrote it in terms of um, the angular frequency, the d omega. So this has an interpretation advantage because now uh, we can rewrite this as u over v volume equals integral from zero to infinity d omega. Um, this is small u. Uh, u omega. And in that case, uh, 
going to leave this one here. Little u, it has that thing over there. Um, it's h bar over pi squared c cubed omega cubed divided by the exponent of h bar omega over tau minus one. So if you write it in this form, um, it looks like a, like, a, like a probability distribution, right? Like we were taking the average or the uh, or the variance of the distributions. Uh, this is the distribution. So the, the, the distribution is given by, by this. Okay, so that is called, this is equation, um, 4.22. This is called uh, the Planck radiation law. And if you, I don't know exactly what page it is. Uh, the, the next one, 94? So there's a, a sentence in Kittel that I really like. It says, uh, quantum theory began here. Yeah, next page. So page 95, quantum theory began here. And that is factually correct. So this equation, it was not, well, I actually, it was a pretty, it's a pretty similar derivation. This equation was first derived by Max Planck. He invented this quantity, the H, the Planck uh, constant, uh, in order to make this thing work. And he thought that it was a mathematical trick. Uh, it was Einstein and a few others that first decided that maybe it was not a mathematical trick, maybe it was the real physics. And um, 121 years later, yep, uh, all the evidence points to this is actually the nature of the universe, the universe is quantized. So let's look at this equation because it's, uh, it's worthwhile. Let's look at the limiting cases, like, like we do with all these distributions. So let the angular frequency go to zero. In that case, h bar omega is much smaller than tau. And then this thing over here, the e, to the h bar omega over tau. You know, we can expand it in a power series like we did before. So this is gonna be, you know, the power series of e to the x is one plus x plus x squared over two plus da da da. So if x is small, like in this case, then we don't need that many terms. We can probably work with the first two So this is gonna be one plus h bar omega over tau. So if we put it over here, then uh, that density, probability density, 
is going to be uh, h bar, well, actually, h bar pi squared c cubed omega cubed 1 plus h bar omega divided by tau minus 1. So 1 and minus 1, we can get rid of those. This is dividing over here. We can put it multiplying over here. And this uh, omega goes away. And then we have this uh, omega squared over here. And the h bar goes away also. So this is omega squared tau. Notice that there is no h bar. So this is not a quantum quantity. This is a classical quantity. This is called the uh, Rayleigh genes law. Okay. So in this case, if we plot against uh, h bar omega over tau, well, actually, because the h bar doesn't matter here, this is just a parabola. This is quadratic in omega. So it looks kind of like that. So you can derive this equation from classical mechanics. If you assume that you have standing waves, just like we did before, even if they're electromagnetic waves, but the difference between the quantum treatment and the classical treatment is that in classical, you use the equipartition theorem. And so all the, all the modes have the same energy. And so you have you know, one mode that looks like this, well, not a few, but you have more modes that look like this. And you have even more modes than look like that do like that. And each one of these is going to have the same energy. And so that means that you, you have many more of these ones because you can feed more. And so that gives you the, the quadratic dependence. And that is problematic because if you take the integral of the omega, and then with this um, distribution is omega squared. You can take everything else out. But guess what? This is from zero to infinity. So this is equal to infinity. So that's bad. It's really bad if your uh, energy density in a black body cavity is infinite. It certainly doesn't happen. So this was called the ultraviolet catastrophe. So, you know, in the early Definitely by the 1900, by 1900. So I guess these measurements started probably in the 1890s. Uh, they started measuring the, the spectrum of things, right? Um, they didn't, they were approximately uh, black bodies, but they were like light bulbs and things like that, you know, that they were inventing uh, at the time. And so what scientists notice is that at low frequencies, the in intensity, like how many photons are produced, uh, actually does look like this. But at higher frequencies, at higher frequencies, uh, it starts to look like this. Right, so you don't, 
you don't actually have infinite energy. It is, it is bound. And what Planck was trying to get when he derived this was this distribution. He was trying to come up with a mathematical equation that will model that. So what he did was first to assume that the uh, modes in the cavity are quantized. And you know, by itself, that is just a factor. Uh, wouldn't change the results very much. But if they are quantized, then he could use the Boltzmann distribution. And the Boltzmann distribution is really, you know, because you have that exponent over here, is really what saves this uh, this thing. So this is the low frequency regime. At high frequency, so h bar omega is much greater than the temperature. Then u is uh, h bar omega over, well, I guess I don't need to write it again. It's going to look very much like this, except that in this case, when the frequency is really large, the exponent is much larger than the cube. So um, as omega goes to infinity, the dependence of this u omega is <clears throat> one over e to the h bar omega tau. Right, so at low frequencies, it looks like a parabola. At high frequencies, uh, it's gonna look like a decaying exponential, kind of like that, right? So um, in you know, intermediate parts, it's going to look like the intermediate function. So the whole thing looks a little bit like this. So if you compare that to figure 4.4, you will see that it looks pretty similar. So this is the, the spectrum of a uh, black body. So pretty cool, no? All right, so the last thing that I'm going to talk about regarding this photon gas is, I'm just gonna mention it, the flux, uh, which is so parameter, parameterized by the energy, uh, is one fourth, and the fourth is some geometric factor. It's a homework problem. Um, the speed of light, divided by the volume, and this is the energy, which is a function of the temperature. So you're essentially looking at you know, how many photons you have uh, per area and per second or per unit time. So just putting everything in there, Mm. So we know the dependence of U, it's this one. And then we're gonna divide by the volume 
So it's pi square tau to the fourth. And then this four goes with this 15, so you get 60. And h bar cubed, and you have an additional c, so this is c squared. So that's the flux. And this quantity over here is called the, oh, it's pi squared divided by 60 h bar cubed c squared is the Stefan Boltzmann constant, which you probably also saw in your modern physics or thermal physics uh, class. All right, so I'm going to switch gears but only a little bit. So this is the start of the next section or big section in the book, phonons in solids. So this is on page 102. And this is the Dubai theory. Okay, so I mentioned before that the mathematics of the phonons and, and sorry, photons and the quantum harmonic oscillator, that they are the same. So quantum harmonic oscillators are actually pretty good approximation of uh, vibrations in solids. So a lot of things are quantized. What is a phonon? What is a photon? Well, it's a photon is a quanta, a quantum of light. Phonon is a quantum of what? Well, I mentioned it last time. Phone, phone is the uh, exactly the Greek the Greek word for sound. So it is not exactly sound. Um, it is a quantum of vibrational energy. Uh, but it you know it so happens that sound is a, a wave. It's a vibration, and so. Some phonons, the low energy phonons, um, are the ones that we can hear uh, as, as sound, that we perceive as sound. And well, sound is gonna be a little different in solids uh, than in fluids, like, uh, like the atmosphere. But they are still sound, like if you put your ear uh, you know, on a, uh, the wall or whatever, you still hear sound. The properties of how it is transmitted are a little different. Okay, so in in the case of the electromagnetic wave, you know, we had the transverse waves over here. And this box was filled with, with uh, electromagnetic waves. Here, what we're going to imagine, or what we're going to model, it's a...
a box with a bunch of atoms. Uh, and you can imagine, you know, that they feel like a simple cubic, right? You have little tiny cubes and you have atoms in every corner. So this whole thing looks like a, like a Rubik's cube. Uh, if you have uh, atoms in the, in the divisions, right, where, where the cubes meet. So the, um, they both have the same distribution function, which is the Planck distribution. We had written this before, but it is written again in equation uh, 4.35. There are, I'm gonna put it over here, uh, some differences that are, that matter. So over here, I'm going to have photons. And over here, I'm going to have phonons. What is a quantum of a human? A quanta of human. A person. What is a quanta of human, of humanity? Humans are quantized too. It's a person. Are you enjoying my morning uh, humor? It's pretty bad, I know. Dispersion relation for photons. Um, Omega squared is equal to C squared K squared. This comes from the wave equation. So for phonons, we are going to assume that this is the case in order for the Debye model to work, but it is not quite the case, okay? So uh, here, V is the, the speed of sound. So this is true in the case of sound for very long uh, wavelengths. So the, the sound that we actually hear follows this dispersion relation. But as the frequency increases, this is not true anymore, but it's fine. We're going to assume that this is true. The maximum frequency What is the maximum frequency that the photons can have? Right. What about phonons? If you have your you know, your system of springs and, and balls over here. Is it infinity? <laughs> because I'm asking about it. But this is given by the interatomic distance. So we can look at this case. Um, so if the wave has long wavelength, then and it's gonna look like that and your atoms are over here. Right, but if you have a wave that is shorter wavelength, let's say, um, 
kind of like this, then your atoms start to look like this, right? If your wave is very high frequency, keep breaking it, then your atoms are going to be over here. They're actually not going to be moving, right? They're, the separation between them is long enough that they are not able to transmit this wave. So that's why it has a limit. So photons can have an infinite amount of energy. Well, there's no upper limit, but phonons do have an, op an upper limit. And that upper limit is dictated by the properties of the, of the crystal. The other difference is the number of modes. For electromagnetic waves, we had two, the transverse modes. But for phonons, we have three, right? You can rattle. You can rattle the crystal like this, and that will make a wave that is transverse. But you can also just punch the box and that will create a wave that is longitudinal. Like one atom is gonna hit the next one, this one is gonna hit the next one. So you have three modes. You didn't have the longitudinal mode in uh, for the longitudinal polarization uh, for electromagnetic waves. So these are the differences, but we're ignoring this one. So we're just going to rewrite what we had before for the energy. For the electromagnetic wave, we had two L over pi cubed, one over eight, uh, I guess that was one over eight, four pi uh, integral from zero to infinity of K squared DK. And then we had that, um, energy distribution. So for phonons, this two becomes a three. This is L over pi cubed, one over eight. So the mathematical treatment is the same, right? But this one is gonna be a three. This one, it doesn't go to infinity anymore. It goes to a maximum K number. Um, which is called KD, the, the Debye wave number. And this K squared DK. And this will be with the EN over here. So if we remove this EN, then this is not the energy. This is the number of modes. Um, and the number of modes in the system is 3n. So n is the number of atoms um, in the, if you consider all the atoms, uh, each one can serve as a node for a wave, right? It's not moving, the, the wave is going through. And each atom has three degrees of freedom. So you have three N. That's the total number of modes of phonons that you can have in a crystal. Okay, so from these, we can get, notice that we don't have the E anymore. This is just the number of, of modes. Um, 3 L over pi cubed, 1 over A, 4 pi, uh, K cubed, divided by 3, evaluated from 0 to KD. So notice that KD is the maximum frequency, right? 
So I'm just gonna put KT over here. The maximum frequency that your crystal can have. And that's equal to three N. So we can get rid of these three. Mm. And this becomes a two. And then that means that uh, I guess we can get rid of this one like this. So we can rewrite this whole thing as L cubed divided by pi squared. Then we had an extra factor of two. KD cubed equals three N. So KD is gonna be six N pi squared divided by L cubed. And this L cubed is the volume. And we can just take the cubic root of this. And this um, number of um, I guess you can call them vibrators, uh, divided by the volume, it's a density. Okay. So the maximum frequency that your crystal can carry is this, six times its density times pi squared, square root of that. So this tells you that solids that are more dense have higher phonon frequencies. Is that true? So lead, for example, is a very soft material. Um, it's pretty heavy, right? So the mass is large, but the number of atoms per volume is not that big. And so, um, you know, the maximum frequency of lead is actually going to be pretty low. Um, other materials, I don't know, like diamond or tungsten, they're pretty hard. Their, their number of particles that they have for volume is high. And so their maximum frequency is really high. Okay, so. If you substitute you know, the, the K equals um, then pi over L, then you get, um, you do this same procedure, you'll get that ND, you can tell it uses N, is, 6n over pi to the one third. And this is equation 4.38. All right, so we will check out the rest of the properties of phonons in solids next time. I'm gonna stop recording.